so this morning we are going to talk about what is actually one of my favorite subjects, um, which is this idea of, you know, our need as people to have kind of daily spiritual practice. And what's funny is if you had known me, you know, about 10 years ago, I would have probably told you this was my least favorite subject. Um, I remember being at a conference with another uh, clergy friend, um, and it was a conference about preaching. We were both interested in, in preaching and, and wanting to work on that. Um, but while we were hanging around waiting for it to start in kind of the uncomfortable chairs of some auditorium we were in, uh, we actually started to talk about this idea of spirituality and, and, and having spiritual practice and all that kind of stuff. And we both were standing there going, you know, we're sitting there, and we're like, we're really terrible at this. Like, we're not we're not good. Like, this is not a strength of ours. We're not even sure what you mean um, when, when people talk about this idea of spirituality or having spiritual practice. Um, we, you know, we really were struggling with it in that moment. And, and this idea that we were called to be, um, you know, we both felt this call to be kind of spiritual leaders in the world, but recognizing, like, I'm not sure what that even means to me, like, in my daily life, um, because the things that everyone else had always seemed to put up and show and demonstrate is, oh, this is spiritual practice, like, they were fine, um, but, but they weren't, they didn't, like, speak to me in any real way, um, and so this was a struggle. It was a struggle for a long time, and it was a, it was a struggle um, for my friend, and I think for all of us, it is, a, it is a constant struggle um, to say, how do, we, how do we make sure we're spending, there's so many t things in our day that are competing for our time and our energy and our attention. How do we build something, um, you know, as a, a, like spiritual practice into that? Like, where, where am I going to find time um, for, for that? Now, what's interesting since then is it's something that I've, I've, because of that, I think really because of that conversation, it was something I started to pay attention to and say, okay, well, what does this mean and how does this work and, 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 and what is God really looking for? Um, um, out of this, does, does, does God just really want us to have this like library of prayers that we have memorized that we can just break out at the right moment, or, or is there something else going on there? Um, and so it kind of set me on a journey. It set him on a journey, too. He's actually now a chaplain at a children's home, so I mean, his job is like spiritual practice like all the time, like that's all he does, um, you know, uh, now, and so we kind of laugh about this conversation, um, but it can, it can kind of mess us up, and we're like, I don't know what you mean when you say that, and, and part of it is how do we understand prayer? Now, there's a couple kind of standard ways we think about when we think about prayer, um, so we oftentimes think maybe prayer looks like this, um, and this is, this is not bad, this is good, you know, um, you know, the Bible is a useful tool, and, and making sure we have those times where we, um, you know, get to have a quiet moment, um, to, to be in conversation um, with God, yeah, that, that, that's important, that is prayer, that is spiritual practice, it's something that we, we should do, um, but oftentimes maybe we think prayer looks like this, which is, you know, that's cool, I don't think I've been that way, um, <laughs> anymore, uh, but, you know, that's great. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's actually this whole interesting um, resurgence in this idea of meditation and, and, and making, you know, putting yourself in a place where you can be calm and relaxed and kind of opened to, you know, what the, the, the Holy Spirit in a new way. I mean, you can get no end. Just go to your app store on your phone and type in meditation. You will find no end of apps that will help you meditate, which in my mind, it is utterly hilarious, because if we need to meditate, it's because of our smartphones. Uh, <laughs> so it is nice that they're willing to help us out with that. Um, but that's, you know, that's, these are kind of the classic ways, you know, we think prayer um, looks like. And, and we, we tend to think this way because we have this idea that somehow, you know, we, we, we exist, as, as, as Carrie Ann was talking about in the children's message, we exist in a body, and, that, and, and then we have a mind, and we have a spirit, and that somehow those, all those three things are like distinct from each other, right? Like there are things that we do, um, you know, that are just, we do them because they're good for our mind, like we read, or we do things that are good for our body, um, like we keep ourselves clean and we go to the doctor. Um, and then there's those things that we do, you know, for our spirit, right? Um, and and they, they kind of d exist as like three separate things. And I get where that comes from. I mean, you know, honestly, God's kind of into this. Uh, one of the things that we talked about as part of the sermon series was Genesis chapter 1. And Genesis chapter 1 is just God like basically separating stuff out, right? Like he's saying, okay, now there's going to be light and there's going to be dark and there's going to be land and there's going to be, you know, sea and there's going to be things in the air and not things on the ground and there's going to be ducks and there's going to be beavers, right? Like these are like, these are different things. You can Google picture of duck and beaver and find one. 
that's the world we live in. Just saying. It's pretty great, um, you know, and, and, and so this is the room we live, right? We, everything nice and neat, and, you know, a couple hundred years ago, we got really excited about this, so we took, like, everything that's alive, and we said there are plants, and there are animals, and mammals, and insects, and I don't know, I'm not a science teacher. Um, but, you know, and, and so we like this. The problem is, it, it's nice and it's clean, but it's not reality, and the truth is, what is, you know, our mind and our body and our spirits, they, they overlap, right? They're not three different circles. They come together. And I know some of you were craving a Venn diagram. You're like, please let there be a Venn diagram in the sermon this morning. Well, there you go. Uh, yeah, I got a couple hand raises in the back. All right. Um, but this is true. Like, there are things, uh, the stuff that we do, who we are, um, who we are as people is not three different things. We are one thing. And as one thing, we have a body and we have a mind and we have a spirit. So really, I guess what's the most important thing you can know from the sermon this morning is on the inside, we are all platypuses. <laughs> right? Platypi? Platypuses? Platypi? My wife's not going to get platypi, so we're going with that, right? Right? Because the platypus, right, it just totally messes up all our categories. Like, it's a mammal on one hand, but it lays eggs, and no other mammals do that, and it kind of looks like a beaver, but it's got a duck stuck on the front of it. Like, it's just weird, right? Well, on the inside, apparently, that's what we are, too. We're all a little weird. Um, and we're not just these three distinct things. We are, we are one thing. And what is good for our bodies sometimes overlaps with what's good with our mind and what's good for our spirit overlaps with everything else because you cannot separate these things and we should not treat them as separate. So while those first things we talked about about prayer, yes, those are critical, important, those are good, but that's not the only place that spiritual practice can happen. Sometimes spiritual practice looks like this. Like this, there you go. Um, you know, I, I, I the, the craziest thing for me, you know, for those of you who um, know a little bit of my story, know that before I was here with you all, I had a job um, where I got to help start new churches in a four-state area, which means I got to drive a four-state area. Not your, like, little weeny eastern states, right? You know, like, big, hardy, western mountain states, right? Um, and, and so I spent a lot of time in my car. I spent a lot of time in my car. And oddly, like every once in a while, I find myself missing it. Because, it, because not because I really enjoyed driving through Wyoming. There's nothing wrong with Wyoming. See, I'm back to Wyoming now, sorry. Oh, and there, yeah. Um, you know, um, but, but there was just something about the time. There was something almost meditative, relaxing, this idea of being able to be alone with your thoughts, um, you know, the opportunity to make time when you would hit those spots, of which there are many, where your cell phone doesn't work and you suddenly feel blessedly released from anyone being able to bother you, right? right? There really was a spiritual component to it, which is really the only way you can survive seven-hour drives from Billings, Montana to Denver, Colorado, is if you make a spiritual practice out of it, right? I mean, that's the only way you can. Um, but there's opportunities there, and it doesn't look like those first two, but it was there, and it was valuable, and it was important to me. So sometimes I find myself just driving for the sake of driving or taking the long way to get somewhere, right, just to get that little little extra time, um, because because really, in a way, it, it, it feeds me in, in so many ways. So sometimes spiritual practice is like this, sometimes it looks like this, right? Sometimes, you know, we exercise, we exercise to take care of our bodies, but exercise also gives us this, again, this wonderful time where our bodies are occupied and doing something, and our minds and our spirits can be a little bit more free, right? This, is, this can be sacred, special, holy time. I have a friend, he's the pastor down at um, uh, uh, St. Park, Park Hill, United Methodist Church. I've talked about him before. Um, he was just in Nebraska yesterday uh, running a marathon because there's this crazy goal of running a marathon in every state, right? Good for him. Um, we've talked about him before. Um, but he, you know, seriously, you're talking about it, and, and he, you know, he, he'll actually talk about it in terms of almost like a spiritual practice, right? Like, uh, and the goal becomes the excuse to practice something that means something to him. Um, sometimes spiritual practice looks like this. When we are in the business of showing love to our neighbors, neighbors we may see around us or labors we never may see, um, when we're in the business of setting aside some of our time to bless others and doing that work that God has called us to, and especially when we get the opportunity to do it in and around other people that we know and we care about or, get, or people we are going to get to know or friendships we get to build, right? That's a spiritual practice and it's important. Sometimes spiritual practice looks like this. Yes, it does. <laughs> Giving is a spiritual practice. 
The practice of being generous is, is, is that. There's a reason that we take the offering during the service right, is that idea that giving is something that we are called to do, recognizing the blessings we've been put into our lives, those blessings that we've received, and sharing those blessings with others. It's what we do sometimes. And then finally, sometimes I think spiritual practice looks like this. This, there you go. This is the youth bowling, if you can't quite tell what that is, right? Sometimes just setting aside a part, sending time to relax, setting times to enjoy what we have been given to enjoy our blessings, to enjoy the opportunities, the idea of appreciating, the idea of just not having any real agenda, but just being able to look at this great and beautiful creation, our fellow people, and just enjoy being around other folks. The truth is, in today's world, we're so busy, we are terrible about this. We have to make excuses to do it, which is why things like bowling alleys exist, right? To force us to spend time just having fun with one another and appreciating the fact that God was so creative to make that person you are sitting next to as well as you, right? Like these are blessings, sacred, important times to us and they can all be spiritual practice if we let them be. All right, so today, um, the scripture today comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and you, rem- you might remember, we actually did a lot of the Sermon on the Mount um, uh, back, I think, in January. Uh, we did several of the passages of the Sermon on the Mount, and we skipped this one. And we skipped this one because, frankly, y- we could spend an entire year on this passage. There is so much in it and going on. Um, and I thought when I was putting that sermon series together, I can't possibly tackle all this in one sermon. So here we are. Um, we're going to try. Uh, uh, but we're just going to scratch surface because it's such actually a quintessential moment. But just I want to remind you where we are um, in this. This is in the middle of this multi-chapter long um, sermon that Jesus gives where Jesus is um, talking to this crowd of people um, who are around him. And in that crowd, there are Jews. And in that crowd, there are Gentiles and all sorts of folks. Um, and it is basically in Matthew's gospel, like Jesus's big teaching moment, right? Now, Jesus taught a lot, but most of the time it just says, and Jesus taught. Um, this is that time where we get an opportunity to hear and see what it is Jesus probably shared during all of that. So in the midst of all of that, and kind of close in the middle of it, um, Jesus starts talking about prayer. And he starts talking about what it is to pray. Um, and he sees there's a couple of things going on um, that he has concerns about. And he says that right at the beginning when he says, do not pray like this and do not pray like that. The first group um, are people of his own tribe, right? Jesus is part of this Jewish community, and he's saying, hey, there's people within our Jewish community, people in our own tribe, um, and when they pray, it's very clear um, that they are doing it to put on a show, and that if that is what you are doing, then your prayers are not going to have the effect that you want them to have, right? And now Jesus lives in a world where there are like all kinds of rules, right? Like there are rules for everything. There's rules on how you wash your hands. There's rules for everything. Like 630 different spiritual rules that you are meant to follow that were spiritual practices that were practiced at the time. Now, if you read all of the gospel, Jesus likes to pick on these things a lot. Um, and, and he and his, and he, and he and um, his followers start to kind of opt out of several of them and they get in trouble. They get in trouble for not washing their hands. They get in trouble for picking grain on the Sabbath day. They get in trouble. Um, People take issue with all of the things that they do. Um, And Jesus' reply is always the same, which is, look, these practices exist for a reason. They exist to connect us with God, right? That's why we do them. Um, So if you are practicing your faith in front of other people so that you can look spiritual, or you're practicing your faith in front of other people so you can demonstrate that you are better than them, then you are not practicing it in the way that it is meant to be practiced. You are not doing what it's meant to doing because that's about showing off. That is not about connecting you with God. So Jesus calls that out right in the beginning. He says, I don't care. He's basically saying, I don't care if you know all the rules and do it all correctly and go through all the motions. If you're not doing it for the right reading, if your heart and your spirit aren't aligned to what it's supposed to be about, right, then, then God isn't interested in what it is that you're doing. That's a pretty bold statement to make, um, especially in a crowd full of people, um, several of whom uh, uh, probably uh, fit that description rather well. It's, it, you start to, right here is when we start to build up this idea, it's really kind of no wonder Jesus gets himself in as much trouble as he gets into. 
right? And so Jesus, he, he's got that group of people. And then the other side of the group is people, he's got his other group. He's got these Gentile people, right? They're not Jewish. They probably have something to do with kind of the standard religion of the day, which if you know anything about like Greek or Roman mythology is what a lot of them would do. So they live in a world with a lot of gods. They would rule, hey, it's an interesting world. It's a world with a lot of gods, most of whom are not interested in what people are doing. Right? So if you're going to pray within that context, he talks about people, the, the Gentiles who heap up a lot of words. Right? Well, because first, there's understanding that at first, if you want to pray to a God, you have to first get that God's attention. And you're better off just praying to a lot of gods at once because you don't know who's around. Right? They might be busy. Uh, who's available or who might be very much interested. So there was a sense, if you were going to pray, you would just pray, like, you would just start, like, it was like going through the phone book, and I'm like, and, and we will talk to Apollo and uh, Jupiter and Moses and Mars and really whoever's around, right? Um, and I'm, uh, so, so that's, that was the standard practice, and you would basically have to convince, you know, the idea was you had to kind of convince some god out there um, to take interest in what it is that you were saying or was interested in what was concerning you, and you would usually do that by first, like, um, espousing how these, uh, how the God was wonderful and believable and amazing, um, and so Jesus says, no, 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 no. You, you can take it for granted that God is listening. You can take it for granted that God cares. We live in that world, we swim in that world, that's our world that we've always kind of, for many of us, we grew up in, so that's not a radical idea, but in Jesus' day amongst Gentile believers, that was a radical idea. This idea that God is actually already there, that God is present, and that God cares about you and what it is that you're going to say. So Jesus says, don't make a show out of it for other people. That's not what it's about. It's about you and God. Don't worry if God is listening or not. God is listening. So if both those things are true, then please say something worth saying. Say something worth saying. And then he goes on and he gives them the words, the words that we still 2,000 years later say every Sunday. And he gave us those words because so that we would say them. It's good that we say them, and they should be words that are kind of written in our hearts. That's what they're for. Um, but he also did it to tell us the kind of prayers we should pray, even when we're not praying the Lord's Prayer. Um, and embedded in that prayer are all these other kind of radical ideas that, again, we've probably said it so much we don't quite notice anymore. Um, but in Jesus' day, we're completely out of the box. First, Jesus starts off by saying things like, Our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. What? Again, you know, a lot of his audiences are Gentile, which means they live in this world of Greek gods where there's like Mount Olympus, right? Like there's this other place that God lives, right? And even today, we still kind of made that idea. We have this idea of heaven, right? There's this other place, like where God is, right? Well, if you're a Gentile and your gods are Mount Olympus, they don't care about what's going on on earth. I mean, look at the stories. Basically, unless there's a pretty girl involved, right? <laughs> They're not particularly disposed to wonder or care about what's going on, you know, down here um, amongst us. So when Jesus says to pray things, something like crazy, like thy kingdom come, it speaks to this idea that God is not only interested in the world that we all inhabit, God's not only just interested in heaven as some far off place, but God is interested in this rock that we are all standing upon and circling the sun in, right? Like God cares about that, God cares about the world, and God cares and would very much like to see the world look a little less like it does and a little more like the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, right? That God is invested in doing what he can to help us make that happen. It's a bold, crazy statement right at the beginning of the prayer. Thy kingdom come. And then he goes on and he starts talking about this. So we go from this great statement about this great idea, this whole idea of kingdom, God's kingdom is big and crazy and out of our minds, right? And then he's like, and give us this day our daily bread. Right? Give us this day our daily bread. You don't go from something more kind of ethereal and theoretical to something more tangible than that. Right? And so Jesus says, I don't honestly, it's not just about the big, crazy, big picture stuff. God cares about the day to day. Give us this day our daily bread. And certainly God uses this idea as a metaphor. God uses bread as a metaphor all over the place. Jesus says, I am the bread of life, even though he hasn't said that yet. He'll say it in a few chapters. Um, 
You know, uh, you know this idea that bread is certainly the, the idea of daily bread is is a metaphor, but Jesus uses it intentionally. But it's also about more than just that. It's basically God saying, "I'm interested in what is going on in your life, down to the smallest details, including the bread that you have every day." Right? And at this point in this life, bread would be, most people would involved in growing crops. Most of the crops they would evolve would be grain, which means daily bread is a really big deal. Daily bread is a lot of the calories you will take in. Daily bread is the difference between life and death. And it looks humble, but it is incredibly important. And God says that, that even that thing, that thing that looks so small that you do every day, you do every day automatically and you don't even think about, that thing, I care about that. That is a gift from me. God says, that's how much I care about what's going on in your life. That it's critically important that you pray for the things that you otherwise take for granted. Give us this day our daily bread. And then he goes on to the next thing. He says, what, forgive us, right? In the Methodist Church, forgive us our trespasses. The other place, some, some traditions forgive us our debts. It kind of varies, right? This idea that's somehow intrinsic to who we are is this idea of forgiveness, that we don't have to carry around all the burdens of all the mistakes we've made in the past. That that is such a big deal, that, is, that God knows that's such a big deal for us. That's something that we constantly struggle with, that it is something that we are supposed to pray for on a daily basis to do whatever we can um, to let go of where we have messed up, to let go where we've fallen short, to not carry that burden around with us anymore because it doesn't serve us. And then, of course, God is being God, and God is pretty darn smart. God ties it to the next line. It says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive that oftentimes the best way, the only way that we can truly find forgiveness for ourselves and stop carrying around the burdens that we carry for ourselves is to stop carrying around what others have done to us. Is that if we want to forgive ourselves, then first we also must learn to forgive others. And we can't just, we can't only set down our stuff, we just have to set down all of the stuff. We can't just sit down, set down the wrong that we have done. We have to set down the wrong that has been done to us. And if we truly want to be free in the kingdom way that God wants us to be free, the only option is to just set it all down. And that for us, that is a daily struggle. So God, Jesus puts it right there in the prayer that we're supposed to pray all the time. Forgive us as we forgive. And then it says, do not lead us into temptation because we live in a world that is simply full of temptation. And some temptations take big, bold forms, right? And some temptations are the smartphones in our pocket that distract us. That text message that comes in at exactly the wrong time, right? The, the thing that says, um, that, that the, the, the Instagram feed that reminds us that everybody else in life is having way more fun than we're having, right? Right? Temptation isn't just about big, crazy stuff. It's not just about big things like adultery or stealing or those sorts of things. So those are important. Don't do those. Thank you. <laughs> but the temptation often comes in little, small forms, right? Those things that basically anything that wants to steal our joy, anything that wants to take away some of our happiness, anything that wants us to convince us that you don't actually have to love that person as much as you are. Right? And it sometimes is big things and sometimes it's little things. But Jesus knows that we will face temptation all the time. So Jesus says, don't help us out. Don't let that become the thing that rules us. Let us enjoy. Let us find joy in where we are right now. And that's the truth about prayer. And that's the truth about spiritual practice. Any time that we are involved in loving God, loving neighbor, or loving ourselves, we are involved in spiritual practice. Any time we are involved in putting more joy and hope and peace and love into the world, we are engaged in spiritual practice because we are doing the kingdom building work that God calls us to do. And certainly, spending some time by ourselves with our hands folded and our scriptures out, that is loving ourselves and we should do that. And sometimes spending time at the food pantry and making sure that those who don't have enough have opportunities to eat. That is spiritual practice. That is putting love into the world. And we should do that. Right? Anytime we are in the business of loving others, loving God, loving ourselves, we are involved in spiritual practice and we should do it. And it comes in all sorts of interesting and crazy forms. 
And sometimes it comes in the form of something that is apparently called a kraut burger. <laughs> so, the other day at a meeting here in this church, um, somebody brought up that there's this thing that exists in the universe and it's called a kraut burger, and I'm very weird because I don't know what they are. Um, or at least at the time, I didn't know what it was. Um, and everyone was very more or less nice about it. Some of you were not very nice about it. <laughs> And so I went home that night, and I Googled it, and I said, oh, well, this seems pretty obvious. I know what this is. And I thought, I'm just going to see if I can make one. And so I did. Because, frankly, spending time in my kitchen, having something like that brings me joy. I like being there. I like the idea of creating. I like being able to take something from a thought or an idea or some kind of inspiration, look around to see what I have, and see what interesting and creative ways that we can do it, right? I just, it just brings me such joy um, to be a part of it. And so truly and completely, a lot of my spiritual practice takes place in the kitchen because it is this place where I get to create and I get to honor the fact that we serve a creating God who is creating all of the time, right? And so it brings me joy to do that and I'm in there. And so now, of course, I do this and I have all these things and they turned out okay. Though somebody kind enough on Facebook was to tell me I cooked it upside down. So you're supposed to cook it the other way. I don't know, whatever. Um, um, you know, so now I, now I have all these things, and I'm like, so what am I going to do with them, right? And I'm like, oh, well, here's another opportunity to bring some joy, right? So I didn't just save them, I, I gave some away, and I think some of them actually ended up, like, you know, driven around town and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and this is something that I do, and it's something I try to do on a regular basis. It l literally is a spiritual practice for me to spend some time making and creating and then s sharing the fruits of that creativity um, with whomever may be around who might enjoy it. We were blessed this morning um, by the, the, the hard work and the, and the, that it takes um, to learn you know, um, how to sing in the way that we were blessed this morning. You, know, that's, you don't just wake up one day and put a microphone in front of you and sing that way, trust me. Doesn't work that way, right? But you do the practice because you bring us joy. You do the practice because it gives you an opportunity. It's, it, it gives you practice because it helps work out your mind and helps work out your body and helps work out your spirit. And then you find opportunities to share that gift with others, to share the joy with others. And when we do that, whatever it is, whether it's a song that comes out of us, whether it's a hug when somebody needs it, whether it's... Um, cabbage and onion and hamburger wrapped in dough. <laughs> Whatever it is when we were about that business, we were about spiritual practice because we were about the world. We were about doing the kingdom building work that God calls us to. So sometimes it looks like we expect it to look and sometimes it very much doesn't. And the problem that I had 10 years ago when I said I didn't think I was very good at it wasn't that I didn't have spiritual practices. It was that I didn't understand that what I was doing was a spiritual practice. God was feeding my soul. I just didn't know when and where and how. I wasn't tuned in and paying attention. And it's interestingly enough, when I learned to tune in and learn to pay attention to where God was feeding my soul, where I was getting my life, where my joy was coming from, it became easier to do all the other things. And it became easier to share it with others. That's what God wants, that's what being a disciple is. It's to take care of ourselves in all the ways that we need to, mind, body, and spirit. To be God's hands and feet, to bring the joy into life, to bring the love into life, to bring the grace into life that God calls us to, however that happens for you. Because it's going to be different. Some of you are really good at one thing, some of you are very good at another. God made us different and unique for a reason. How we communicate with God is different and unique for each one of us, but we get to take for granted that God is there, that God is listening, that God cares, and that God is there when we're walking through the woods and we feel so close to him. God is there when we're meditating. God is there when we're praying with our scriptures. God is there when we're driving in our car. God is there when we are cooking in our kitchen. God is there when we are practicing our music. God is there whenever we are putting our gifts into practice to love God, love our neighbors, and love ourselves. When those things are going on, 
we are practicing our spirituality. We are doing what we are asked to do. Amen.